Sometimes people think that um, they have to go through all these steps and do all these different things in order to really approach the Lord. No, you just turn to Him by faith. As soon as you enter in by faith, there's a grace upon your life for you to enter in with boldness. And so you just turn to the Lord by faith and, and just be intimate with the Lord and just start there. No matter how your day's been, no matter how your week's been, no matter what you've been through in your past, you can just push pause. Like, you know what? It's a new day. It's a new moment. It's a new minute. It's a new hour. I'm stepping into the new life of Jesus by faith. The old things have passed away and I'm stepping into the new things today. And, and you take a minute and do that. And so this morning, let's just, as we, as we just start this beautiful Sunday morning, let's just, let's just do that corporately. Let's do that together. Just get, uh, just... I, I tell Pastor Arnold all the time, I, I live inwardly like a monk. <laughs> inwardly, I just live separated to the Lord. And so there's times in my heart where I literally just just go and be with him in my heart. Jesus, I love you. You're amazing. And so just enter in by faith. And so, Father, we love you. And Jesus, we worship you. We honor you. You commune with the Lord. Just just be with him in whatever, whatever way you feel is right in your heart. But just turn your heart to him. Jesus, we love you. We honor you. We're just so thankful for who you are, Jesus. You're just so beautiful. Everything about you is lovely. You're the lily among thorns. You're the fairest among them all, Lord Jesus. There's nobody like you or beside you. You truly are the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus. And I thank you that, Jesus, you humbled yourself. You made yourself of no reputation. And you came in the likeness of a man. Even though you, you, it wasn't considered robbery for you to be equal with God, yet you came in the likeness of a man and you died for us. That you took on flesh, fulfilled the law so that we could enter in. So that you could see us, Father, as if we've never sinned as a sin has never even touched or affected our lives, Lord. And so I just pray that confidence would be established in us today, Lord, and that the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus would get very big in our hearts, Lord, that, that we would truly shine like lights because your righteousness has shined upon our life, Lord. And, and God, I just thank you, Father, that our bodies are coming into righteousness. Our minds are coming into righteousness. God, I thank you we're not a product of our past. God, I thank you that we're not just a product of, of what we've been through or what we're going through right now in this moment, but Lord Jesus, we're products of the cross because Jesus, you came in the flesh and you died for us. And so, Father, I just thank you. We're just stepping in this moment. We're putting off the old man. We're putting on the new man who's been renewed according to God and true righteousness and holiness, Lord. And so, Father, we put off all these other things. We don't even consider them no more. I just thank you they're as far as the east is from the west, God. And I thank you, Father. We don't even consider the old things, but we just look to the righteousness the holiness, the love that's available in you now, Jesus, that you've came. And so, Father, I just pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, you just lead our hearts. You take us by the hand and lead us and guide us into all truth. And Holy Spirit, I just thank you that it's your good pleasure to give us the kingdom. It's your good pleasure to put this, to pour yourself out and upon our lives and to pour from our hearts like rivers of living water. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord. We honor you. We love you. We bless you. And everything about you is lovely. Everything about you is holy. And Jesus, I just thank you. I just thank you for the simplicity of living in a relationship with you, being led by the Spirit. Lord, we set our minds on the things of the Spirit, not on the things of the earth. And I just thank you that we're going to be a people that walk in the Spirit. And if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And by the Spirit, we're putting to death the deeds of the body so that we will live today, Lord. And so, Father, I just thank you that there's going to be deeds of the body that's put to death by the Spirit today, Lord Jesus. That the Spirit's going to come, Lord, shine a light on your word. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And your word's going to cut and remove things out of our lives today. Remove wrong thinking. Remove sickness, disease, things like that out of our body. Everything that's contrary of the truth, everything that's not from you is being removed in our life today from the word of God. And I just thank you, Lord Jesus, that that word is sharp. And I just thank you, Father, that, that the Holy Spirit is just making the word so sharp. I just even see in my heart right now, like just like how you would sharpen a knife. I see the Holy Spirit making the word of God sharp today as it's released in the word, as it's released in truth. And that's going to go forth and just cut things off of our lives, Father. And I thank you for the truth that sets us free. I thank you that your truth is sure and steadfast. And God, I thank you, Father, as we enter into different seasons, Father God, you stay the same. And your truth remains, Lord God. Things may change. People may change. Circumstances may change. But Lord God, you're faithful. You're the rock of ages. You never change. You're constant. You're steadfast. Your truth, your truth is absolute. And your truth is freedom and liberating. And so, Jesus, I just thank you for the truth that sets us free today. Truth that sets us free from wrong belief, wrong thinking the little foxes that come into our vineyards and want to spoil the grapes, that those foxes are dying today because the sword of the word of God, Lord. And I just thank you, Jesus, for uprooting this, this seeds inside of our hearts, seeds of unbelief, seeds of doubt that's been sowed, Father God, in our lives because of circumstances or experiences, Lord, they're being uprooted. And the truth is going to come like a light and shine upon our lives, Lord God. And it's going to change and challenge the way we think today, Father. And God, we just love you and we bless you. We give you all the glory and all the praise, Lord God. It's not of ourselves, it's by your spirit. So we yield 
yield to your spirit. We surrender to your spirit this morning. And we ask your spirit to have your way in our lives and our minds and our thinking right now. Holy Spirit, come have your way in our bodies, our hearts, our organs. Father God, even our joints, that joints would be released this morning. Knees would be freed right now in Jesus' name, God. And Father, I just thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in every area of our lives, Lord. And God, we just thank you for it. And Jesus, we love you, we honor you, we praise you, and we just celebrate you. We just honor you. We just celebrate the victory. We celebrate what you've done in people's lives just over this past week, God. We just celebrate healing. We celebrate freedom, God. We just thank you, Father God, that the peace of God is going to come and rule in our lives. The peace of God is ruling in our lives right now in Jesus' name. And that the God of all peace is crushing Satan under our feet shortly. And Father, we just celebrate that, that the God of peace... That peace was the characteristic you chose to crush Satan under our feet. And so we're going to let the peace of God rule and reign in our lives. That Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. And that your kingdom rules in peace. Your your kingdom doesn't rule in chaos. Your kingdom doesn't rule in confusion. Your peace, Father God, rules right now in our lives. Your peace rules right now in our hearts and and in our families and our finances, God, in every area of our lives. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that your peace is crushing everything that the enemy has affected our lives with. The peace of God is coming. Just the, the end of strife the place of rest, the true peace of God, that the Prince of Peace, your peace, Jesus, you said you give to us. We don't have peace in the world. We don't have peace for medication. We have peace because you're the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so, Jesus, we thank you for your peace, Lord. We put off all these other things that we try to find peace in, and we enter into your peace. We enter into your love. We enter into your joy. We're not trying to produce those things in ourselves. We're abiding in you, and those things are being produced in our lives as we abide in you. And I thank you for using the fruit of the Spirit as fishing lures in our lives that Father God, people would see your fruit bared in our heart, would see your fruit bared in our lives, and they would see and know that there's a God in Israel, that there's a God who's real, that there's a God who saves, Father. And I just thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit bearing good fruit in our lives, that we're abiding in you. We're, we just even right now uproot ourselves from other things we've tried to plan ourselves in, and we plan ourselves right now in you, Jesus. We are in Christ, and we're going to begin to abide in you. We uproot, out of, uh, we uproot out of confusion. We uproot out of chaos. We uproot out of wrong thinking right now when we plan ourselves in the truth of Jesus. And we abide in you right now, Father. And I thank you that everything that's in you, Jesus, is going to be produced in our life. Your very joy, your very health, your very kindness, your very sweetness, your very love is now being produced in our lives because we're just abiding in you. And Father, I just thank you for a restful heart of abiding in your people right now, God, for that very peace right now. Begin to rest and rule and reign in our hearts that Jesus, you came. And I just so just thank you that you came. You didn't leave us off to ourselves, Lord. You just didn't leave us off in the, on, in the dark on the side, but Jesus, you so loved us that Jesus you came and I just thank you Jesus and we honor you and we celebrate you that you came that you left heaven you left glory to come to us to model to us what we was made for to reveal the father's heart to us Lord and I thank you for making the father's heart clear today through our lives as we see through you Jesus Holy Spirit I just thank you for putting the salve on our eyes for just putting balm on our eyes so that we could see clearly for putting balm on our hearts for healing God God and I just thank you Father Lord, we love you, we bless you, we honor you, that Jesus, you are lovely and perfect in every way. And Jesus, I just thank you. We trust you. And Father, right now, I just just feel that in the room. Would you guys just release that in the mouth and say, Jesus, we trust you. Jesus, we trust you. We don't don't trust our old thinking. We don't trust what we think is right. We don't trust how we think things should be. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. We trust who you are. We trust your nature. We trust your character. We trust your finished work. We trust your blood. We trust your body. Lord Jesus, we trust the stripes on your body. Lord Jesus, we trust that you're sitting on the throne. We trust that you're living forever to make intercession for us according to the perfect will of God. And Jesus, we just trust that your blood is speaking a better word that Jesus, we trust this morning. We just lean into you and our hearts are free from insecurity as we lean in and trust in you, Jesus. And so, Father, we don't trust what we've seen. We trust what you've done, Jesus. We trust the finished work more than the circumstances, more than than experience, more than any other thing. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. We trust your blood applied to our life. We trust your righteousness that is uh, given unto our lives. It's been imparted to us, Jesus, because of you. Jesus, we trust those things. We trust who you are in us, for us, and towards us. Jesus, we trust every part of you that, Jesus, you are holy. We trust that you are the king, and we trust that you are Lord. We trust that you are coming, and we trust that you are going to make us perfect and 
spotless and blameless before you. Jesus, we trust you. Lord, we don't even put our trust in other things. Every other thing will fail us, but Jesus, you will never fail. And we trust that you will never fail. We trust that you are the sure foundation that we can build our lives upon. So when the the rain comes and the wind comes and the waves come and beats in our house, Jesus, we trust that our house will stand and it will stand strong because we trust in you and we trust in your word. We don't trust in the lie. We don't trust in any other thing. We trust in your word. And I thank you that, Jesus, we trust your word. That is your word that sets us free. And Jesus, we trust everything about you. Jesus, we love you. And God, I just thank you that right now that trust is being released in our hearts to follow you, to listen and obey, Lord Jesus. I thank you that trust is being released into our hearts, Father, to be led and moved by the Holy Spirit as you say go, that we trust you, that you're going to take care of us as we go. When you say come, we're going to trust you as you take care of us as we come, Lord. And I just thank you, Jesus, that that trust is leading to obedience, that trust is leading to a deeper love relationship with you. And Jesus, I just thank you right now for releasing trust into your body, trust into our lives right now, trust into our hearts and minds right now. God, I thank you, Father. I just thank you, Father, right now in Jesus' name. I thank you that you're not a thief. And God, I just thank you that right now trust in you is removing veils. It's removing fog out of people's minds, out of people's lives, what they think about you, that trusting in you, trusting in your goodness, trusting in your love, trusting in your mercies that are new every morning, trusting in your love that never fails, trusting in your mercy that triumphs over judgment. And I just thank you, Jesus. We trust that where where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. We trust in the much more. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Jesus. We trust in that, Father. And as we trust in who you are and what you've done, you're removing confusion of who you are out of our minds, out of our lives. Yet, Jesus, we trust that you're going to give us a single eye that's so focused on you and our body will be flooded full of light. Lord Jesus, we trust you. We just thank you, Jesus. Would you celebrate Jesus this morning? Yes, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Man. Man, that's just, you just commune with the Lord. You talk to Jesus. I remember when I first started praying, I I knew I needed to be praying. I knew I needed to be spending time with the Lord. Um, I was like 20 years old. I remember I, uh, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know how to talk to the Lord. Nobody ever told me. I'd never seen anybody really model or demonstrate anything, you know, really really imitate Christ. The Bible says, Paul says, imitate me because I imitate Christ Jesus, right? And so there's a place where you can still live your life. Can you imagine to live your life in such a place, so empowered by the Holy Spirit, so changed and transformed by who he is and what he's done, that you can rightly say, imitate me because everything that I do, he does. And I never had, but I never had nobody to to imitate. I'd never seen anything modeled or demonstrated of what it looks like to walk and live in communion with Jesus. And so I remember I would go into Briley's playroom um, so I, we lived in an apartment in Joplin, Missouri. I'd go into Briley's playroom and just all of her toys and stuff was in there. And I remember I would, I would picture in my mind that Jesus was standing about five feet away from me. I just pictured him standing there. And I remember just beginning to use my imagination to talk to the Lord Jesus, just like I would a friend. I didn't know the scripture. I didn't know to pray scripture over my life. I didn't know to release and declare intimacy out of my life. I didn't know, Amy, Julie, you guys are being a huge distraction right now. Amy. I mean, really, then you're being a distraction. Everybody's looking at you guys. And so I didn't know to do any of those things. And so I would just stand there and I would just talk to Jesus like this, like, and just like how I would talk to you guys. Yeah. And that's what I would do. And so um, I, that's how I kind of began my prayer life. And I remember one time I was doing that. I, haven't, I don't know if I've shared this in a long time. And uh, kind of was just coming back to me as, as I started sharing. I remember I was doing that in Briley. I'd just given my heart to Jesus. God had radically saved my life. I didn't know he loved me. Um, and I was talking to Jesus like that. And Riley was in the living room. And I would listen to, uh, there's a song by a band called Flyleaf. And it was called All Around Me. It's kind of like a rock song. Like kind of like a heavy metal song. And I was listening to it over and over again. And she was in there. I had worship music on. And she runs in there. Riley, at this point, maybe had been to church like once or twice in her little life. Probably, I mean, if we wasn't taking her. We wasn't going to church. And so she didn't, I mean, she wouldn't have known about Jesus except for what was just happening in that very recent, those very recent maybe weeks, maybe a month or so in our apartment about Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. And Riley comes running into the playroom and her eyes are huge. I'll never forget it. And she runs and she says, Dad, I've seen Jesus. And I was like, what? And I said, well, what do you look like? And she had these big tears and I, tears flooded her face. She said, he had holes in his hands and in his feet. I said, you've seen Jesus. And I just begin to celebrate Jesus. But how many of you know the Bible says he can do more than you can ask, think, or even imagine. So is there a place you use your imagination for the glory of God? 
So if he can do more than you can even ask, think, or imagine, as you give your mind and your heart to Christ Jesus, which your mind and your heart always co-labor together. Now, can something come into your mind that you have to reject as a lie before it migrates to your heart and takes root? Yes. So if a lie comes into your mind, the enemy comes and he speaks a lie to your mind. How many of you know it's a bait that you can buy? You'll believe it in your heart because faith is the place that happens in your heart. That's where faith comes from is your heart. He who does not doubt in his heart. So, But that faith can also be in a lie. Because if you believe a lie, you empower a lie. Just like if you believe the truth, you empower the truth. So if you believe a lie, you empower what the enemy's placed into your life. So he speaks a lie of, of you're not good enough. You bite that. You'll begin to see the fruit of not good enough in your heart and depression, frustration. You'll see the fruit of not good enough and, and uh, you'll, get, you'll get all sorts of crazy things. It's not from God, all sorts of fruit because you believe the lie in your mind. And so but how do you know you can use your mind now to glorify Jesus? You can begin to imagine the glory and the goodness of Jesus. And it's actually a tool that God has given to worship him with. And it's, it's so beautiful. I really believe that God wants to and not use your imagination to, to drift off in lofty things and, and, and vain things that really are meaningless. But just, just use your mind to imagine hospitals empty out. Begin to use your mind to imagine rehabs. Everybody's healed. All the tracks are gone off their arms. Veins are restored. Their lives are restored. Just begin to use and imagine your mind of the Holy Spirit pouring out in northwest Arkansas and southwest Missouri. And God, and the fire of God. To use your mind to see the fire of God pouring out on your family. And, and whatever you can imagine, it actually puts a draw on God as you give Him your mind and imagination to do greater than what you just imagined. Because He'll do greater than what we ask, think, or even imagine. And so that's, that's when you begin to build expectation. That's when I see expectation happening. But expectation, expectation and hope basically mean the same thing. Expectation and hope basically mean, mean the same thing. And that's always a future faith. Hope is a future faith. Faith is a present reality. Faith says now, hope says then. Here's what tends to happen in people. Holy Spirit, is this Okay. People have an expectation of how they think God is going to move and how he should move. And if it don't happen according to their expectation, there's a disconnect now in their faith. But how many of you know there's a place where you surrender your heart, allow him to father you, speak to you, walk in a relationship with you. Besides, that's more than what you're just seeing with your natural eye so that he can father you through those times. Because God is so much bigger than we could ever ever ask, think, or imagine. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes our expectation actually becomes a place where people develop unbelief. Because we have this predetermined mindset of how it should look like, how it should go, what it should be like, what it should say, what color it should be. So when people have this expectation, they come to a tent, they expect this is what a tent revival should be, and then we have a Pentecostal revival, then they check out because this is not what I expected. This is not what I expected. It's not what I had predetermined in my mind what it should be like. But how do we know? God's God. And if it's the Spirit of God, He says, What man of you who has a son, if he comes to his dad and says, Dad, I'm hungry. And he says, Okay, son, what do you want? And the son says, I want some bread. And the dad hands him a serpent. He says, he says, No, Dad, I don't want a serpent. Can I have an egg? And the dad goes, No, here's a scorpion. He says, No, no, no. It don't work like that. And if you being evil... Because we're evil in comparison to God. There's only one moral standard. There's only one right, and it's Jesus. There's nobody in this. There's nobody in this room that's right. There's one who's right. His name's Jesus. Amen. And we have to settle and humble ourselves. The fact that only Jesus is right, and we have to live in a relationship to Him. However, when you seek the Lord and you seek the Holy Spirit apart from your expectation, but you're living by faith and just believing God, and your heart's open to His voice, open to His presence, and what He wants to do in your life. How many of you know that He's so much bigger than what you've ever asked thought or imagined? But he says, how much more will your father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Be quiet, because he's not going to give you something bad if you're asking for something good. He's good. He's a good father. But our expectation can sometimes lead us to believe he's not always good. Because we felt like we have unmet, failed expectation in our life. I felt like my grandma should have been healed this way. I felt like this is what should have happened. I felt like this is what should have took place. And since I had an unmet expectation in the Lord of what I thought should have happened, I developed an insecurity with me about the goodness of God. How many of you know that's a temptation to happen? But how many know you know there's a place in your life you have to surrender those things to the Lord, allow Him to father you out of those things so you can see through the single eye of Jesus that God is good, not because of your circumstances, but because He stuck His Son to a cross, took all of my curses, and I was yet a sinner. 
Does that make sense? And so, and so there's just that, there's just that thing I see it in people's lives all the time, and people actually will begin to question the goodness, the reality of God. And when that happens, and 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 the sovereignty and forbearance, and, and man, God's so good. He's such a good father. And people begin to question that, man, and it'll, and it'll build up all sorts of, of unbelief. And then here's what happens. We'll see lots of wrong thinking about different things about the nature of God because of unmet expectations that don't line up with the life of Jesus. Since we have unmet expectations, we have to have an answer, a reason why. So then we have these little, I call them little foxes that come in that spoil the grapes, that come into our vine. And we develop these little things. And really the root of it, the sources of it, when you get down to it, is unbelief. Or maybe something happened and we needed comfort, so we, we came up with something in our mind about God that's not true, so we can find false hope and false comfort. Yeah, that's good. I'm, come on. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And the Lord says, I'm going to have something better for you. When, when we were coming to the, the revival, this is what we, Paul and I have always said, I have an expectation. I don't have one. I'm expecting the Holy Ghost to do whatever you want. I don't have one. But I don't have one. That's exactly how you do that. Uh huh. I don't have one. Yeah. I'm waiting. Yeah. I'm just waiting to see what he's going to do. Yeah. Praise God, he's going to move. I know he's going to move, but I don't know how he's going to move. I, I know he's going to move, but I don't know how. That's how. That's actually the, the best place to rest in expectation is to say this. I know you're going to move, Lord, but I'm not going to decide how you should move, Lord. You're going to move however you want to move because you're sovereign. You're the Lord. And I know you have a heart for that moment. I know you have a word for that moment. I know you know exactly what you would want to say. If you were standing in this room right now with this group of people, you know exactly what you would want to do. And when you understand that, it's so peaceful. Yes, that is peace. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, it puts you in a place to receive too. You get yeah, your heart's you open. You have an expectation for something. Once the thing, what God going to do? You going to do it this way? Yeah. Then you're not in a place for, to receive what He really is going to give you. Yeah. Because He's got something better. Yeah. Your expectation is here. Isn't it? As always, way high. He's so much better. How many of you have like, I know God's going to do something, and when He did, you're like, that was so much better than I could have ever even imagined. Than what he was ever going to It was so much better. And I'm so glad I waited. I'm so glad I trusted. I'm so glad I didn't move in my own strength. I'm so glad I didn't step out when I thought it was right or when I expected it. But I waited on the Lord. And when he answered me, I just celebrated. I was like, wow, that was so much better. And really, and it's those expectations that will put us in works. that Because we think and we'll try to produce something that God's saying, wait a second, son. Wait a second, kiddo. I love you. Wait. You know what I mean? Surrender to His will being done in your life and all yours. It really is a place to surrender. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And the, and there is a balance in it because if you know His nature, you know His will. The two are inseparable. So you know we know who He is because of Jesus. So so you see Jesus, Holy Spirit. I feel I think I, I feel this. Okay, I just want to make sure I steward this right because if this was heard wrong, people can just be weird. <clears throat> Man, when you see Jesus, what you actually have. In the Gospels, what you actually have is like like father-son, father-daughter encounters. So when they brought the adulterous woman to Jesus, they threw her down and said she was caught in the very act, probably poorly clothed, maybe naked, we don't know. And Jesus stands and basically defends this woman against the entire crowd. What she was really seeing was a father-daughter moment. Mm-hmm. It was God saying, this is my girl. Yeah. Being represented through the life of Jesus. Yeah. And everything about who God is, the way he moves his heart towards us and for people is represented in the life of Jesus. Now, now those little foxes want to come in and make that blurry, make that foggy, and make us question His goodness. Put our, take our eyes off the goodness of the Lord that's been modeled through Jesus and put it on our own things, on our own experience, our own expectations, our own unmet expectations, and just things. And there becomes this big disconnect. And so, but there's now this balance of, of this, I, I know God's going to move, but now it's going to be, always be in the parameter of His Word and His nature that's represented in Jesus. Yeah. Does that make sense? And that's the balance. And so I know he's going to move. So the word of God actually becomes the riverbanks and the spirit of God flowing becomes the experience. So now we experience God in the context of the word of God. So the word, let me try, I'll try this side of the room. So the word, <laughs> so, so the word of God becomes the riverbanks. Like we're looking at, a, imagine a mighty beautiful river. The word of God becomes the riverbanks, the flowing river. Listen, he says rivers of living water will flow from your heart. He doesn't say lakes. He says he's, you're not a lake, you're a river. 
He's flowing, he's moving, he's touching, he's shifting, he's changing. He's, he's, he, he wants to move and flow with things. And, and, you just, and, and when you get in a river that's, that's flowing like that, it's beautiful. You just sit in your little canoe and you just say, it's beautiful. And you just worship Jesus. But, but imagine, and so then we experience Jesus. He says, touch me. Come on, Come on Thomas, touch me, handle me. Handle me, see, touch me. I'm not a spirit as you suppose. I'm a man. He's a man. There's a man sitting on the throne. Jesus came, fulfilled the law as a man. Why? To give us dominion and authority back that Adam lost in the garden. And but then the but so we experience him in that reality. That's the current reality of Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father as a man. He has a beard. He has a Riley and I was talking one day and we got to giggling because he was talking about what we're gonna do to Jesus when we see him. <laughs> Use your imagination. And it's beautiful. I and I said, oh, bro, I'm going to grab his beard like this. And I'm going to pull him to my face. I'm going to go. <laughs> and she got so tickled. She said, Dad, you can't pull his beard. <laughs> it was plucked out for me. <laughs> I'll be melting. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hearing praise and rejoicing as I wake in the morning. And the, and the dreams I've been having reveal how the enemy attempts to hinder praise and worship. And also attempts to block the flow of the waters. This Whoa. is part of life that is like flow out of each moment we live. From these waters flow everything. Everything. Life, peace, healing, rest, strength, everything. all power. Joy, comfort, everything, everything, everything that we can partake of. And this which flows through us, it flows through us, he said. So come and drink of the water of life freely. For our Lord invites us to come and drink, drink deep. Come on. That's the Spirit of God. <laughs> it's the answer of everything. But then the, 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 the Word of God... But how many of you know that's what we're talking about? Those unmet expectations become a hindrance to praise. Because now we're sitting there, we have something to happen in our lives, and we think we're questioning the goodness of God because we had something, a lie built up in our mind, and we begin to accuse God. But there's one who's called the accuser of the brethren. And he wants to accuse the Lord. He wants to accuse people. He wants to take over your mind so you can't praise and celebrate and worship God. Because if you, listen, when you begin to partake of life, celebration is the automatic response. You know, I, like I was sharing with Josh earlier, um, I had identity issues mm. all my life. Yeah, yeah. Rejection, yeah. Um, <clears throat> drug addict. You know, I seen myself so little, you know, never honestly seen myself as Jesus' bride. And man, as a survivor, I looked at myself, and I can't quit looking at myself in the mirror. <laughs> Hey, I am beautiful, child. I am not that mental, disabled, crazy, Christy, hillbilly, Oklahoma girl. I am Jesus. That's right. You're exactly and right. I just weep. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. 47 years. Come on. Yeah. I mean, it's like, whoo. Yeah. Okay, Lord. <laughs> That's so Thank good. You. Thank you. Yeah, come on. God's good. He he's is. good. He's, he's a good father. He's amazing. Yeah. Truly blows my mind. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. And 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 praise, celebration, freedom is the, always the response of drinking from the waters of life. It, it, it is. It's he's, it's life. It's living. It's everything you ever have need of. If you're lacking your identity and you feel insecure, drink from the waters of life. You'll find. You know what the definition of insecure is? It means not securely founded to something solid. Yeah. Come on. Not securely fastened to something solid. You've attached yourself to other things that you don't have really have faith in. If you're depression, if you have things battling in your heart, there's there's wind and yeah. waves in your heart and mind, and there can't be no peace and there's no calm. Uh -huh. He's the peace and the calm. He says, "Peace to this storm in your heart and mind." There's a quiet you can hear. You can see clear. You're 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 peaceful at night. You're laying in bed. There's the waves ain't raging in your head. The wind ain't blowing in your mind of all the craziness you've been through, all the things that happened today. And there's just a peace and a calm in your life, and you can finally rest and just be be at peace with Him. You can live like that. You live from that place. Peace isn't a product of what's happening around you. Peace is the product of a person inside of you. And His name's Jesus, and He's the one. He's the Prince of Peace. 
And so regardless of how chaotic things can be around you, you can be sleeping on the boat. You know what I mean? And it's be why? Because you're aware of the presence of the one who's in you. The one who is peace. The peace isn't peace isn't a natural circumstance, peace is a person. Yeah. 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 Then just love on him. Yeah. That's what you do after that. That's what you know. The the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of drinking from life, is always intimacy with Christ. You know what I mean? That's the it's the response. You're like, oh my goodness, I love you. You saved my life. I've been born again, my Lord Jesus. I was lost in my sin, and you rescued me. You made all things new. I love you. You're beautiful. You're amazing, and your heart just explodes because of freedom. It is. It's true. Go to go to John chapter seven. We better read the better read some scripture. People people think I'm a heretic. Did you know we've been going for thirty minutes? Chapter seven. It's already been thirty minutes. Look now, people scared to people scared to talk in class now because. Oh, wow. Yeah. Probably about not getting here. And I was like, well, is there anything that you can take away to where she'll, you know, because she can't move her. She's a girl. She can't just say, hey, get in the car. So that's what that was about. So hopefully she's going to go get her. I'm hoping. I don't know. But, you know, so just keep Hannah and your thoughts and everything. Yeah. Mm. Yes, Jesus, we love you. <coughs> Lord, Jesus. Faster, I love you. I love you. <laughs> John chapter 7. Let's start in a... Oh, this chapter is all just so good. I, I, I want to I land on a, around 37, but I'm just, I want to make sure, Holy Spirit, I want to just speak something to us in this. <clears throat> Mm. <clears throat> yes, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Okay. Yeah, let's just start in verse 37. So Jesus is went to the Feast of Tabernacles. At the at the feast that Jesus went to, he says he kind of was he was he wasn't hesitant to go there because he's just being led by the Father. Everything Jesus did, Jesus says, I, I do because the Father tells me to do it. Everything I say is because the Father tells me to say it. So that tells me that everything Jesus modeled for us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he modeled by a present relationship. Everything that Jesus modeled in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he modeled with a present relationship with the Father. That's what he's saying. And so, so at, the, at the start of this chapter, there's a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles, which Jesus is, is our tab. Jesus is everything. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the feasts. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything. Say, everybody say this with me. This is, this is, uh, this is, this is perfect theology. You ready? Jesus, Jesus. is everything. It's just like that. It's in the book of Acts, after Jesus has died, he's resurrected. It's, it's, it's the Passover. The Holy Spirit's about to be poured out. It's 50 days after, right? After, uh, after the Passover, it's, it's the Feast of First Fruits, right? And it says, when the fullness of this feast had come, why was it the fullness of it? Because it was fulfilled in Jesus. Amen. Pours the Holy Spirit out. There was a first fruits of gathering in of Christians, of believers into the kingdom of God. All that stuff is represented, fulfilled, satisfied in Jesus. I'm telling you, if you look anywhere in your life except for in Christ Jesus, the thief will steal from you, kill you, and destroy you with wrong thinking, with all these other things. So everything that we live, do, move, have our being has to be seen through the eye and the lens of Jesus. He's everything. He is perfect theology. Everything about him is perfect. Yes, he, is. he modeled the Father perfectly. And if you're not seeing the Father clearly, you're not seeing yourself clearly, you have to look at Jesus. Jesus is the perfect representation of what we should have looked like born in right relationship to God our Father. Amen. So if you want to see who you are, it's impossible to see Jesus rightly, see Jesus perfectly, and not see yourself. As soon as you see Jesus, you see who he was made for and what he was made for. And that's to live in a present relationship with your Father. And that's what Jesus did. He restored to us a perfect peace, a perfect relationship with the Father. The Bible says we have such peace with God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
So Jesus tore his flesh, the Bible says, which was like the veil that was rent, that was torn, so we could enter in through Jesus to present us back to the Father. We've been born again back to God the Father. That's Jesus. And so everything is in Jesus. And, and I can't say that enough because I hear a lot of people say a lot of things that you cannot find in the life of Jesus. And so if you want to if you want to go back to the foundation of things, the place where you build your life up, Jesus calls himself the chief cornerstone. What's he saying? He's saying everything about the Lord, everything you believe has to be built off of Jesus, because if you don't, your building's going to be funky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll be real funky. And you can even throw monkey in there. Real funky monkey. And it'll be stinky. <laughs> well, how many of you know you can even believe things about God that sound right, but it's a half truth that keeps you experiencing full life? There's, there's, there's little things, little, I hear people say these little things, these little bombs, these little, these little things that we've, we've decided in our minds because of bad experiences, unmet expectations you cannot find in the life of Jesus. And it's a faith robber. Yeah. It, it muddies our vision. It muddies how we think. It muddies how we see. Someone receives a diagnosis, and because we've lost people in the past for cancer, all of a sudden that person's diagnosis is cancer, and we just think they're going to die because of past experiences. We are not seeing that situation through the eye of Jesus. We're allowing a diagnosis to rule and become that person's identity, and you're partnering with that lie. Jesus says, by his stripes we are healed. And so that's the truth. That's the reality. You know what truth means? Things as they really are. Jesus is the things as they really are. So the sickness that's in people's body is a lie. And Jesus bearing that sickness in his body is the truth. Now if the lie is still being manifested in your body, speak truth over the lie until it changes and it breaks. The sickness is the lie. It's a lie. It's not just illegal. It's a lie. The truth is you're healed. So if there's sickness, there's a lie present in your body. It's a lie. From the, you'd see, but, unless, but if you don't see that clearly through Jesus and what he's done is sacrifice, you'll make excuses for the lie of why it's there. And when you make excuses for a lie and believe the lie, you empower the lie. You give the lie authority. The Bible says that Jesus disarmed principalities and powers. It didn't say he destroyed. It says he disarmed. So I believe we can rearm principalities and powers when we believe a lie. Yeah. It says he disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. So when Jesus is hanging naked on the cross, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords hanging there, all of his bones are showing. They ripped his beard out and mocked him. He's the Lord of love and he's hanging there. It looked like the enemy was making a public spectacle out of Jesus. But what the enemy didn't know, Jesus is hanging there and said, you just wait three days. And when I raise back up, I'm going to justify my people with my blood. I'm going to restore the right authority and dominion back into them. And he removed the authority that the enemy had over our lives because of the law and sin. He removed sin off of our lives and fulfilled the law. Didn't abolish it. He fulfilled it. So now God sees us as if we've never sinned or fallen short. And as if sin has never stained or touched your life. And he disarmed principalities. But you begin to believe a lie. You rearm those authorities that once ruled over your life in the first man Adam. You're no longer born from the first Adam. You're born in the last Adam. That's the gospel. So now we get to live a life in complete freedom from sin and complete freedom in the righteousness of God. I don't have to be self-conscious or live in an inferior identity when I know he's died. Hallelujah. I'm not a product of my past, what I went through, where I was, when I think yeah. about myself. I'm not. But, but listen to this. How many of you know you get a diagnosis of ADHD because somebody said that over your life because you was bored in class? Come on. And all of a sudden you begin to release ADHD over your life. So now you have a reason for you to be the way that you are. You're empowering a lot. It's a lie. And then we medicate it. We think it's okay. It's not okay. It's a lack of realizing truth in the life of Jesus. We're not seeing clearly the life of Jesus. I know that's hard. I know it's extreme. I know it's fanatic. But what he did was a lot more extreme than what I'm saying. He came as God in the flesh. I'm not saying he's not God. Listen to what I'm saying. He's God. Came in the flesh, reduced himself down, placed himself into the womb of a little mama named Mary, was born upon the earth, fulfilled the law perfectly, died as a man, was dead for three days in the grave, and the Spirit of God came back upon Jesus. Life came into a man, and he rose. Now he's seated forever at the right hand of the throne of God. What he did was a lot more radical than what I'm preaching. That's victory. He's on the cross. The devil thinks he's got him. 
He's not going to raise the dead no more. He's not going to heal the sick no more. But what the devil didn't know, he was taking a seed and putting a seed in the ground. And the seed was about to be reproduced inside the people of God. Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground to die, and DNA dies alone, but it's going to produce much fruit. Oh, wow. Come on. To get for himself a people like himself upon the earth, that's, that the enemy no longer has rule, reign, and authority over our lives when we realize who we are in Christ Jesus. Am I there yet? No. Do I know what we're called to? Absolutely. Am I chasing hard after it? You bet. Yes. And I want us to run together and run well. I'm not standing up here saying I got it figured out talking down. I'm saying family, let's go up higher. Family, there's more for us family. We don't have to live in these things. Family, we don't have to be defined by what we're defined by. Family, we don't have to allow these things to rule our lives. Family, we don't have to do this. Let's go up higher. I can see something that we're called to. Amen. And you see it in Jesus. He says... In John chapter 7, verse 37, it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. Now, this, this is amazing that Jesus did that. There wasn't too often times in Scripture that he cried out. The Bible says, actually, Jesus was meek. He was very mild. It says that his voice would not be heard in the streets. It says, A bruised reed, it's like a brittle reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. And he's talking about in relation to how he deals with people. And so, most of the time when people live their lives in sin, there's a wage. The wages of sin. So when you live in sin, there's a wage. And so most of the time, we think God's crushing us when, before somebody really surrenders to Jesus. You ever notice that somebody gets to a place in their life and they're like, I have nowhere else to turn but Jesus. It's probably because they've been living in sin and they've been paying a wage that they're unable to pay any longer. Come on. Because it's, in, it's talking about how he handles people. And so, but then he meets us there. <laughs> He's like, he just, wrap, he just wraps you up. He, he throws you on his shoulder. Hey, call the boys. Call the family. I found my sheep that was lost. And we're going to celebrate. <laughs> so when he stood and cried out, this is a heart cry of the father. You know how we were talking about that earlier? It's a heart cry of the father. So this is a heart cry. This is a big deal for Jesus. When the Bible says Jesus cried out, you catch this. I mean, it's all, it's all glorious. It's all beautiful. But I'm telling you, this, isn't, this is uncommon. It was for the nature and character of the Lord. He, he, was, he was humble. He was the most. Can you imagine the humility of Jesus? We can't by our, our, our natural minds. But the humility of Jesus is this. He's God. He's the one that said, let there be light. And darkness gave way and light went. <clears throat> he said, now let earth come up out of the sea. The ground began to rumble. The <sighs> land began to come up out of the sea. Sure, he said, ocean, stop right there. Waves, stop right there. The one who spoke in stars filled the sky. He's God. God. And he's coming as a man. He limited himself to natural things. The Bible even says that he was tempted at all points as we are. Yet he did not what? Without sin, but he was tempted at all points. He didn't even reduce himself to the point where he was subject to temptation. He was tempted in the wilderness. That tells us that what he did, he did as a man. Because the Bible says God cannot be tempted. So he was God, but he emptied himself of his divinity and did everything that he did in right relationship, a present relationship with the Father. Not an existing one, but a present one. Why? To model for us what it looks like to walk when we allow the Holy Spirit to inhabit our lives. When we become conscious of the Holy Spirit, His voice, His activity, His movement upon our lives. We become a resting place for the Spirit of God upon our lives so He can flow from us. And we walk in a present relationship with God the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit seen clearly through the life of Jesus. Wow. To model for us what it looks like. And he's, he's the model. That's why He's the last Adam. There's not another one. There's not a third or fourth. He's the last one. Why? From the first Adam became a whole, the, the, the earth, human mankind. But now there's a new last Adam. There's a, a new creation. The Bible doesn't call us humans anymore. The Bible says we are now citizens of heaven. Family, you're not citizens of the United States of America. That means you're now subject to a new king and new laws and new rules. There's a new king that rules over our lives. We live in a new domain, a new region. We have a new king, new territory. His name is Jesus. I messed up this morning. <laughs> and so Jesus cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, listen to him, let him come to me and drink. That's, that's huge. Say, Jesus, Jesus 
I'm coming to you. It's, it's open all the time. There's nothing in Jesus that's ever hindering. It's always us. He's open. He's made himself open. He's made himself available. Jesus is available. How many of you know you can get up at 2 in the morning like Aunt Christy does? Or you can get up at 2 in the afternoon or, or be a, and, and you can enter in right with him, be with him, come to him. There's nothing in him ever hindrance. We, we never, and he never leaves us, but sometimes we lose, the, we lose consciousness of his presence. But that doesn't mean he's not there. He's there. How many of you know even when you was in the world and you was living in sin, you got in that car wreck, he was there. And you lived, and you, and you persevered. There's things in your life that should have took you out, but there was a present Jesus that you maybe wasn't even aware of that was there, that was there saving your life because your life has purpose and destiny that the enemy was trying to rob off the earth. Wow. Come on, the Bible says to walk in wisdom to those who are outside redeeming the time. That's what it says in Colossians chapter 3, I believe. That word time isn't time as in quantity of hours and, and years and days. That word time is actually a word time that means quality of time, an appointed time, a season of time. So he's saying you redeemed the time. So you maybe felt like at one point in your life you had a calling, but you lived off in the world. Jesus never lost his call and life on you. But now you get back in Jesus. Guess what you can redeem that was once appointed for your life? You, the Lord never wastes anything. When he speaks something over your life, he's not going to withdraw it. He said, I'm waiting for you to fulfill it. And so you actually begin, he gives you the power to be a steward of your time. To redeem means to purchase with cost. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. So you can, you can purchase back time that the enemy stole from your life to, to walk in wisdom to those who are outside. So, so if there was something, God, a dream, a calling, a desire, God placed in your heart, you seen unfulfilled because you walked away from the Lord for a season. He didn't do away with that calling. He's waiting for you to redeem the time now to step into what he made of. He's always been available for you. That's good news for people. How many of you know? But how many of you know that happens to people? They feel like at one point in their life they needed to do something. They walked away from the Lord. They come back to the Lord. They think that's never available for them again. They're standing in worship questioning the goodness of God. Come on. <laughs> I've seen it. I've done it. Missed that. No, you didn't. Redeem the time, kiddo. There you go. <clears throat> Where are we at? He who believes in me. So, man, you have to sometimes. Well, how am I doing? Okay, I'm okay. I got three minutes. Um, <laughs> he who believes in me, as the scripture has said. So Jesus is even saying, this is what's been written. This isn't, this is God. It's Jesus saying, this is the fulfillment of what you were made for. He who believes in me. So what's, what's the avenue to open your heart up for living water to flow out of? Belief. You believe. This, you believe. We trust, we believe. We, we, we give wholeheartedly to the words and the life of Jesus. And as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers. Rivers. Is that even, is that a, that's not even singular. Did you guys see that? Why? Because it's a river for my family. It's a river, it's a river for, for my ministry. It's a river in my finances. It's, it's rivers of life in every area that I'm allowing God to function in. It's a river of life for every need that I have in my life. It's not, a, it's not a singular river for just to meet one need. It's a plural river that he wants to flow out of my life to bless, touch, and, and, and manifest the kingdom of God in every area of my life that I'm willing to believe and give way to him for. But I must first recognize apart from him I'm thirsty. Yeah, yeah. I can't do it in myself. I can't produce these things in myself. I can't produce the love of God in myself. I can't produce joy in myself. I try to do it in myself. It's going to leave me thirsty. Yeah. Why? Because I'll just see my inability to do it. I'll try to produce joy in my life. I'm like, man, I just I lack the ability to produce joy in my life. It's because I'm trying to do it in myself. You can't do it in yourself. You do it by relationship with God and allowing the Holy Spirit to get real big in you. Declare the word of God and you just push past the feelings and emotions that's ruling your life at this moment. And you, and you step into the joy of the Lord. Believe, you believe amen. that you have his joy. Yes, amen. I have his joy. We have his joy. Say, I have his joy. I have his joy. His joy. And the Bible says he was anointed with joy more than all of his companions. He was a man of laughter. He was amazing. The Bible says he was also some called him Jeremiah. Why? Because he, he wept. He would see the multitudes and, and be like, oh, it says his heart would groan and grieve. And he would weep. And Lazarus died. 
And he wasn't weeping because Lazarus was dead. He was weeping because they wasn't, resur- they wasn't realizing he is the resurrection. He's like, you guys aren't seeing me clearly. It was, it's like, it's <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like Jesus. <laughs> out of his heart that's that's where it'll flow from not out of your head if you if you, evalu- if you evaluate things out of your head there will be no living way there'll be criticism <laughs> there might even be some gossip some slander come out of your head <laughs> can you imagine that that tent up there Full of holes. I can't even believe the Spirit of God ain't going to move in that. Out of your head. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it changes the way you see things and people, the goodness of the Lord. And it's dirty. The feeling is dirty. You guys should have changed yeah. that a little bit. Yeah. You couldn't spray that down with a power washer. I wanted to. I thought about it, but I just didn't have time to. I mean, I. I was trying to be mindful. I was, I was living out of my head. How can I please as many religious people in here as I possibly can? I was, I was, I was, I was joking. I'm, I'm joking. That was, I, I cried. No, I'm reeling it back in. I'm back in. Jesus, forgive me. I love you. Okay. Let's, 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 uh, I'm going to end right there. We've been here for 50, 50 minutes. Let's pray. Bless the Lord. Go up to heal. Love on somebody. Grab somebody's neck. Prophesy over somebody. Pray for somebody. Jesus, we love you. We just thank you for the word this morning. God, we thank you for our graduates. God, I thank you for the new season that they're stepping into, Lord Jesus. And I thank you for giving them wisdom, counsel, discernment, Lord God. I thank you for opening doors before them that need to be opened, Lord, and closing doors that need to be closed, Lord. And I thank you that no man can open a door that you've closed, and no man can close a door that you've opened before these kids right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we bless them. God, we thank you for the word. And we just thank you even, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together and to be with you, to be in you, Lord. And God, I just thank you. We celebrate you, Lord. We love you. Jesus, we honor you. You are altogether lovely and beautiful. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.